All right, so we've got a few extra folks logged in. So we're gonna get started if that's okay. Welcome and uh, hello everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is John Messman and I'm a team lead at the South Nation Conservation Authority. My job at the authority is to support the management of our public community land and conservation areas in Eastern Ontario, while also supporting our community stewardship and outreach work. This webinar is proudly sponsored by South Nation Conservation and is being delivered on behalf of the SDG Butterfly Way project. A few housekeeping items uh, for us tonight, for those who are tuning in. Uh, we will be delivering this webinar on Zoom so that we can support some discussion and Q&A at the end of Dr. Talamy's presentation, which means that the chat is open. Most of you on the call already have figured that out, uh, as well as the Q&A box. So as we go through our presentations, please feel free to drop any and all comments in the chat, and please feel free to add any questions that come up in the Q&A box on your screen. And as the presentation continues, you should be able to see all the questions submitted by the other viewers, and you should be able to upvote uh, those questions throughout the meeting. If there are lots of questions at the end, uh, we'll address those questions based on the number of votes that we've received. This webinar is also being recorded so that it can be shared with volunteers in our network and it will be posted on the SDG Butterfly Way Facebook group in the future. Now to get us started, I'd like to see if the chat function is working for most people. And, and again, thanks again for those who tuned in early and, and dropped a message. But uh, for everyone else, if you could try and find that chat button on Zoom, drop a hello in the chat, say who you are, and, and we'd love to hear where you're from. Uh, drop your closest town or region and uh, you know, share anything interesting with the group to help get the, the conversation rolling. Thanks to those who are dropping comments, appreciate that. Now, before we introduce our guest speakers tonight, we wanted to start our webinar off with some information on our agency, the South Nation Conservation Authority, as well as share some resources available in Eastern Ontario and information about the volunteer network that's brought us all together tonight. And thanks again to the volunteers in the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, who helped encourage so many others to consciously think about our actions and how we can impact our local environment. Now, for those maybe less familiar with our agency, we did wanna start off with a few comments on who we are and what we do. And so to help you understand our role in conservation and, and why we've partnered with our municipalities and community volunteers on some pollinator initiatives in our region. We are one of Ontario's 36 conservation authorities and we operate under provincial legislation called the Conservation Authorities Act. But we also deliver other work through agreements with provincial ministries and our own municipalities to deliver local environmental services in our region. In our area of Eastern Ontario, we work for 16 different municipalities, including the city of Ottawa, and municipalities in Leeds Grenville, Prescott Russell, and Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, with our watershed jurisdiction around the South Nation River and its tributaries, which begin near the headwaters in Brockville and then near Plantagenet, where our river empties into the Ottawa River. Our jurisdiction also extends to both the St. Lawrence and Ottawa River shorelines. These jurisdiction expansions have occurred in recent years at the request of our member municipalities to help deliver vital services like floodplain mapping and flood forecasting. And our work is also governed by our board of directors, which are comprised of municipal elected officials like mayors and local councillors that are appointed by our municipalities. And in different times, we would have loved to have welcomed you to our rural office in Finch, Ontario, but we know that hosting this webinar online also helps everyone enjoy this presentation from the comfort of your own home with close access to, we hope, to some food and beverages to keep you engaged throughout our talk. One of the main objectives of our work is to protect people and property from natural hazards like flooding, erosion, and landslides, and to support sustainable development activities through environmental and technical reviews to ensure that new construction is safe and sustainable. On behalf of our municipal partners and the province, we also study, map, and regulate areas with increased development pressure where there are known hazards. And we work directly with people to make sure that projects 
can keep you and your investment along with your neighbor and their property safe while contributing to a healthy environment. We also complete environmental monitoring work to help report on watershed conditions and environmental health. And we use this information to inform environmental reviews for new development projects, but also to help us fundraise and direct our fundraising dollars towards areas in poor health to get more trees along water courses, manage things like invasive species on our properties and restore important wetlands, for example. We also deliver a number of different environmental stewardship programs through agreements, including things like roadside tree programs, water quality improvement programs for farmers that help offer cost share funding for projects that help improve water quality. And we also have an ASHU replacement program in the city of Ottawa and probably our most popular service being our tree planting program, which is often what people know us most for. There are a variety of different tree planting programs and subsidies that we're able to use uh, to help offer trees for landowners as low as 20 cents per conifer and 50 cents per deciduous tree. And I'm also happy to announce that our team finished, just finished our spring tree planting season just last week. And we were able to help plant over 230,000 trees on public and private land, which does set a new record for annual trees planted by our authority, which we're very, very proud of. And a final slide for our overview, we wanted to mention that we are a public land trust and we have been working to protect significant natural spaces through acquiring land since 1970, through partial purchase and donations. Some properties have been acquired for flood mitigation, some to keep people, uh, some to keep from being developed, like areas within the Castleman to Lemieux potential retrogressive landslide area, and others were acquired to contribute to a sustainable natural heritage system and for public community benefit. We now own over 13,000 acres of forested land. We manage the SDG County Forest on their behalf, and we operate 15 different day use parks that we call conservation areas. I also wanted to mention that many of our parks and natural spaces are on land that was donated to us by people to help protect and conserve their family's natural legacy. Each year we accept more and more land through donations and we're able to offer significant financial benefits to donors through split receipts and through Canada's ecological gift program. And for those interested in learning more, please feel free to check out our website at nation.on.ca or our YouTube channel where you can view some great videos to learn more like the one on your screen. Now, before I introduce our SDG Butterfly Rangers, I did wanna share two quick slides with some information and resources for our municipalities. While this webinar will focus on some of the actions that we as people can do within our communities to make a positive impact, I also wanna recognize that there's lots that can be done with our municipalities, work, projects and, and behavioral changes that will go a long way to help increase and sustain biodiversity and to support our pollinator friends. First, I wanted to mention that the Canadian Wildlife Federation recently launched a rights of way habitat restoration program for monarchs and other pollinators, thanks to some funding support that they received from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Part of this project included creating a local Eastern Ontario seed bank for wildflowers and funding to help our municipalities implement pilot projects along roadways. There are a few great examples from other counties in Eastern Ontario that have changed their mowing practices and are members of the Canadian Wildlife Federation's community of practice where public work staff and land managers are able to get together to share examples, experiences and some lessons learned from different practices that they've implemented in their region. In the coming weeks, we will be sharing some of this information from this network with all of our municipalities in our region to help bring some of these our staff together. And like the webinar we're co-hosting today, there's some great resources that have already been produced uh, and some of these on the screen recently in the last few months uh, by the Canadian Wildlife Federation that help explain to land managers how they can create pollinator habitat in their communities and learn from other municipalities and cities on what they've done. There's also lots of case studies from our neighbors south of the border that are really helpful. And we will be sharing some of these resources with our municipal councils and staff in the coming weeks. Sorry for clicking that video. 
Next, I would like to acknowledge the volunteers working with the SDG Butterflyway Project and for their work and initiative uh, within the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, and of course, for bringing the idea for this webinar forward. It's our hope that this webinar will be a great resource for the volunteers in this network, and it will be something that we can go back on and rewatch for some great advice from our guest speaker as time goes on. The Butterfly Way Project is an initiative by, led by the David Suzuki Foundation that began back in 2017 with a few pilot cities in Canada. The mission was to plant native wildflowers in yards, schoolyards, streets, and parks, and to support bees and butterflies. The goal was to establish local butterflies flyways by planting at least a dozen pollinator patches in each neighborhood and community. And over the last few years, the foundation has recruited and trained thousands of butterfly way rangers that have helped plant, I think, nearly 50,000 butterfly friendly wildflowers and have helped establish thousands of new pollinator patch, patches and communities across the country. In SDG locally, we were fortunate to hear from two residents, Christina Enright and Carol Fiddler, who both have great stories of their own, saving monarchs on milkweeds, along county roadways before Boeing activities, through their special collector's permits, and also helping to raise hundreds of monarchs last year on their own. The value in working together in a network like this is that we join Canadians across the country to help make a positive impact for the environment and for our communities. But also when we work together, we have the power and the ability to influence changes in our behavior and in our community practices so that instead of saving hundreds of butterflies, we can save thousands. So for those on the call, I'd love if we could give a virtual round of applause, so to speak, to Christina and Carol, because they've done such a great job in bringing people together and and to put their thoughts to actions on their own properties. And they're responsible for bringing us all together tonight on this webinar. You'll see on the screen that uh, I've screenshotted a photo from Christina's new Instagram and YouTube accounts that have helped document her butterfly or recent butterfly experiences with, with monarchs. And I encourage you to check those out whenever you have a moment. And that brings us to the end of my summary and, and leads us into the webinar tonight. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our guest speaker and presenter for tonight, Dr. D Doug Tallamy, who is a professor of agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, whereas he has authored over 104 research publications and has taught insect related courses for over 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the, way, the, the many ways that insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Darkle, was published in 2014, Nature's Best Hope, which is a New York Times bestseller, which was released in February 2020. And his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released in March 2021. Among his awards are the Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dudd Jr. Award of Excellence, the 2018 AHH B.Y. Morrison Communications Award and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. Professor and author Doug Tallamy will discuss some of the next steps that each of us can and must take to increase and sustain biodiversity. And with that, I'll take my presentation down and I'm gonna ask Dr. Tallamy to unmute himself and share his screen with us. Thank you, John. And like I mentioned in the introduction, guys, please feel free throughout the presentation, drop some questions, drop some comments in the chat, and uh, hopefully that'll contribute some, to some good discussion at the end. John, you have to enable me to, to screen share. Sure, just one sec. <laughs> or it'll be a real short seminar. Might take me a second there, Doug, just stand by. Do you wanna try again? Yeah, there we go. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight um, and thank, thank you all for, for joining me. 
I'm way down south in southeast Pennsylvania, but I bet I'm almost as cold as you are. We're having a cold snap right now, so we're back in March. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about what my idea of, of nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to revisit what happened in much of the East in 2019. Uh, we had what we, we uh, call an oak mast, where oaks from at least Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia and as far west as the Mississippi, oaks in the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those oaks or one of those acorns and I just stared at it and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. It forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. Kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. And that's a very dangerous time for this insect because there are a lot of things that want to eat it. So it wiggles and squirms to get itself beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it, it stretches in all directions and forms a little chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays in that chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but it's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts, uh, where's my point? Mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets down into the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year like most insects? Uh, and the answer is that it, it takes uh, red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns. After the acorn label has, has left the acorn, of course, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they leave acorns. And if they find a new acorn, they get excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move and they grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. And after they're moved in, they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? That is uh, simply one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the very specialized interaction between jays and uh, oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. The specialized interaction between witch hazel and winter moths, things like the bicolored sallow. Uh, that's how witch hazel is getting pollinated in, in the, the late fall by a series of these moths that fly very late. I caught this guy on Christmas Eve. The specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they feed their young. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia, because that is the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees in North America, and um, over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. So in the upper Midwest, there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of uh, perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. I could go on all night talking about nature specialized relationships. But today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that we can't leave uh, North America as it was because we haven't. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states in the U.S. It's anything close to the, the original pristine ecological condition that it once was in. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. We've got over 770 million acres of rangeland, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. 
We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for, for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done all that. I wonder too, uh, but I suspect we thought the earth, our nest was so large, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that and we're, we're starting to hear about that now and, and some pretty scary headlines that are coming along at, at an all too regular clip. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline, Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of the North American bird population gone. And now the UN says, uh, well, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. And I love the way they, they report these things as if it's just another headline. They might as well say, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline as if it doesn't matter. It does matter. This cannot happen, folks. We cannot allow this to happen. Well, I could go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus at this point, but the, the most famous entomologist probably of all times, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects on planet earth. And he did it in a paper called The Little Things That Run the World way back in 1987. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fishes would disappear. It would collapse, which means all those animals would disappear as well. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers. All you'd have left is, is uh, bacteria and fungi. And humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that does not have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on what we call ecosystem services produced by healthy functioning ecosystems. And those ecosystems are run by the plants and animals around us. What do plants deliver? And we talk about delivering ecosystem services to, to humans, but they deliver them to all the living things that are out there. Things like oxygen, pretty important. Clean water, equally important. Carbon capture, tremendously important in today's, today's world. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere out of harm's way, locking it up in their tissues, but then pumping the extra carbon they, they capture during the day into the ground through their roots. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have put there over the eons. And by the way, once carbon's in the soil, it's stable for thousands of years until it's turned over again. Plants build topsoil and they hold it in a place. They, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather. They convert sunlight into food. And if we lose plants, we're gonna to have to eat sunlight without them, and that's gonna be tricky. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and other things. So developing landscapes like this, or designing landscapes like this that uh, destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's, it's actually a terrible idea. We have 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. So taking large portions of, of the planet out of commission for a status symbol is just, just a uh, very bad idea. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to uh, work on our relationship with planet Earth. Aldo Leopold was one of the most uh, eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he, he said was that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. 
Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that for long periods, but, but you know, our large Western societies and our large Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more uh, from the earth than it has to offer in a given place, completely wrecking that area, then moving to another area, completely wrecking that, clearly not sustainable. So Allah had a dream. He dreamt that, that we humans actually uh, were smart enough to learn to treat the land with a little bit more respect to use the land. We knew we, we knew we had to use it. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine, but to do it gently enough that we didn't destroy local ecosystems. And he called this, this new approach to the land, uh, developing a land ethic. He wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he didn't talk about was developing a land ethic at home where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in, in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I wanna argue uh, this evening is, is that living with nature not only is an option, it in fact is now the only viable option that's left to us. Of course, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people excuse me, we now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where we've, we've um, dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get, get the smaller every single year, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's go back to private property. We're not going to succeed unless we do conservation on private property because so much of the land is privately owned. Uh, in the U.S., 85.6% of, the, of the, the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned, and it's very similar in, in southern Canada. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail because we won't be working on, on properties that are big enough or connected enough to conserve the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. There are a number of conservation op opportunities that we're not taking advantage of right now, but we could be. Like power and pipeline rights of ways. We've got 21 million acres in, in the US of power and pipeline rights of ways. So that's a lot of land right there. Railroad rights of ways, 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Roadside, 17 million more acres. And then all the places we live, both in, in rural areas and in, in suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. If you add up just these and you can think of other areas, that's 599 million acres where we could be doing conservation, but right now we really aren't. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation almost anywhere. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm really talking about reconstructing uh, natural systems that we've dismantled. I recognize they won't be exactly like they were when we before we dismantled them, but that doesn't mean we can't reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that you have functioning ecosystems once again. There are things we have to remember though, uh, and that is there are building blocks of uh, ecosystems that are essential, we can't do without. Groups that uh, other groups depend on. One of the most important groups, of course, are the flowering plants. They're capturing energy from the sun through photosynthesis, turning it into food, and then the energy is stored in various plant parts, mostly the leaves. But you're not gonna have those plants unless you have the, the pollinators that enable those plants to, to reproduce. So, that group is, is essential. Well, now we have the energy from the sun locked up in uh, plant leaves and other plant parts. If it doesn't uh, leave the plant, in other words, if animals don't eat the plant, then the, the energy is permanently locked up in the plant. You don't have any animals. Well, it turns out most uh, vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something typically is insects. And it also turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So when we design new landscapes, they have to include lots of caterpillars or you're going to have a failed food web. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. You've got the black cat chickadee. They're, they're practically the same bird doing the same things. 
Chickadees, of course, are at our feeders all winter long eating seed. 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seed. The other 50% is insects, even in the wintertime. But when they're reproducing, which is right now, um, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young entirely on caterpillars. Uh, and chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of, of uh, terrestrial birds in North America rear their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that uh, my grad student, Ashley Kennedy did recently. She put out a call to bird photographers to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. They were gonna send those pictures to, to Ashley. She was gonna identify the prey items that were in the beaks of those birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds as she could in North America. She got thousands of pictures and was able to reconstruct the nestling diet for 20 of the common bird families in North America. And, in, and that's what you're looking at here. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet that was caterpillars. So it turns out that in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet, which means if we took caterpillars out of our landscapes, most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. Something special about caterpillars. Let's, let's talk about what it is. Uh, there's actually a number of things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is his exoskeleton, his cuticle. It's made of chitin, it's undigestible. Birds don't want a lot of chitin. And because the caterpillar is soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your baby without fear of injuring it. If you ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. They're big as like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. Now, a lot of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but uh, do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? Caterpillars are nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Much of a beetle is undigestible and a lot of beetles have very sharp edges. And finally, it turns out caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. You're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have lots of carrots so I get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes so I get my lycopene, lots of whatever that is so I get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. Carotenoids improve sperm vitality. They improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this, this prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. He takes those lutines, he makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Well, where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From their, their prey items, of course, but uh, carotenoids are not equally distributed among invertebrate prey. These first two bars are types of caterpillars, far more carotenoids uh, in caterpillars than in any other type of invertebrate. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that are eating green leaves where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. Uh, so the earthworm, uh, the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any, get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Well, that study and a number of others are suggesting the caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. It's really looking like they're essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars, particularly when they're reproducing. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two caterpillars enough or one or two caterpillars a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Um, let's go back to chickadees because we have a lot of data on chickadees, although it has been demonstrated that, again, they're not exceptions. This is happening in most birds. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? Well, one or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to, to uh, get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, 
uh, the, bird, the, the parents continue to feed the young caterpillars for another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to bring a bird uh, that's a third of an ounce to uh, independence. And this varies because depending on the number of birds in the nest. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because in so many places, that's all that's left is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because the chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if you don't have all those caterpillars in your yard, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of bird declines that everybody's measuring. We went to the original data set, uh, Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we separated the terrestrial birds into two groups, the birds that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the birds that don't. So things like doves and finches that can reproduce on seeds. Uh, they, the ones that don't require insects didn't lose any numbers over the last 50 years, but the birds that do require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that uh, as, as insects disappear, so do our, our birds. And it's, a, it's not a rocket science concept. If you take away the bird food, you take away the birds. So I'm concluding that we need to rethink what we're landscaping for. In the past, we've landscaped strictly for aesthetics. We've chosen the most beautiful plants from all over the world. Uh, and if anything came to eat them, we made sure we, we killed it. Well, that's created very dead landscapes. So um, let's, let's think about that again and try to create landscapes that are pretty, but do support the insects that support everything else. How do we add caterpillars to landscapes? Well, you do that by adding the plants that, that support caterpillars. It seems easy enough, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So you have to be fussy about it. You have to add the plants that do. And nothing demonstrates this better than our friend, the, the monarch butterfly. Um, you can have all of the Asian ornamentals uh, in your yard that you want. You can have all the buckthorn and all the, the Bradford pears and all of the boxwoods and burning bushes and all the other things we put in our yards. And you won't make a single monarch butterfly. You know this, of course. The only thing you're gonna, that's gonna make monarch butterflies are, are milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that uh, most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists, just like the monarch. Why is that? Well, because plants have made them that way. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they, they protect their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those tissues, particularly leaves, either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And any one insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are very similar and they get very good uh, over evolutionary time at developing the adaptations that are necessary to circumvent the defenses in, in those plant tissues. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that uh, minimize the exposure of the insect to those, those compounds. But again, it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It doesn't happen overnight. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that plant lineage. That's why the monarch is not gonna switch uh, to, to eating boxwood just because you take away the milkweeds. It's gonna die first. And that's why when we bring in plants from other continents, most of our insects cannot eat them. Those plants have not been here nearly long enough for our insects to adapt to them. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to reconstruct food webs, when we're trying to rebuild nature, uh, we have to choose the plants that, that will allow us to do that or it's not going to work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose uh, the right plants. And I'm gonna start with uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania, that's Southeast Pennsylvania. We own 10 acres on a farm that was broken up 
It was a very old farm, been farmed for 300 years. Soya was totally exhausted. And the last thing they did was to mow it for hay. Um, well, when you mow for hay in this area, you're really mowing all of the Asian invasive species that we have, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and autumn olive and porcelain berry and on and on and on. You mow that and you call that hay. So when we started to build the house, of course, the mowing stopped and all of those things came roaring back because the rootstocks were still alive. So we had 10 acres of invasive species. That's my wife, Cindy. She's getting ready to clear those 10 acres and she has. Uh, so yes, it's a daunting task. And if you are over, overrun with invasives, I, I understand how you might think it's impossible to get rid of them, but it is not impossible to get rid of them. Cindy has proven that. Um, it is a lot of work. There's no doubt about it, but it, it is worth it. What was I doing while, while Cindy was clearing the land? I was telling her she was doing a great job. But I also, it was my job to put the, put the plants back. And of course, the, the goal here is to, to rebuild the biodiversity that was once on our 10 acres. It had been devastated by agriculture for over 300 years. Uh, so the, you do that by, again, reconstructing the food webs that support a lot of caterpillars so you have a lot of bird food and everything will come back. One of the things I wanted to see if I could get to our property was the Canadian outlet. I'd never seen a Canadian outlet. Um, that's what one looks like. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you don't have Canadian outlets unless you have meadow root. So just like the monarch specializes on milkweed, Canadian outlets specialize on meadow root. And we didn't have any meadow root. I'm sure there was meadow root here hundreds of years ago, but it long, long gone. So I got some meadow root seeds from someplace and planted them. They grew very nicely. This was early on though, and um, I really had very little faith that Canadian outlets would, would find my meadow root, my little patch of meadow root. Maybe they had to come all the way from Canada. I didn't know. So I didn't even go out and check my, my, my meadow root. But uh, after about two months, I walked by it you know, for some other reason, and it was loaded with Canadian alice. So it was a, a, a big success and a rapid success. And now we have a good population of meadow root and Canadian alice. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This beautiful moth is a specialist on, actually has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a misnomer. It's a specialist on Biden's Aristosa called Ditch Daisy. Uh, I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut 14 miles away. So I got some Biden seeds. I planted them. They grew very nicely. Well, in this case, it took about a year for the moth to find my, my Biden's Aristosa, uh, but it did. And now we got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species now. Same story with the Hackberry Emperor. Wanted the Hackberry Emperor, uh, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it belongs here. It should be on our property. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry and we didn't have any Hackberry. So I planted Hackberry. Um, it took four years for the butterfly to find our, our Hackberry, but they have found it. And we've got a good population of both of those now. Walked by one of my Hackberry trees last June and there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. And along with it came many things that depend on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. Not sure why it hasn't found our, our goldenrod. Um, that's what the adult looks like. This is what the caterpillars look like. But this is part of the fun. This is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I check my goldenrod. And one of these years I will find goldenrod flower moth and it will be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I know a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why they don't like Virginia creeper. It's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's got good fall color. It makes uh, very, very nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. It's a great pollinator plant in the spring. We don't seem to recognize that because its shower, flowers are small and not showy, but the native bees love it. By the way, when you're planting a pollinator garden, don't think like a human, think like a bee. You're planting the resources that they need, not the prettiest thing that, that we can find. But the big deal is that, that uh, Virginia creeper is the primary host plant for the large sphinx moths that are the primary, primary nestling diet for our cardinals. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. 
Wanted to see if I get the double tooth prominent just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Even if you don't like caterpillars, you have to appreciate this guy. Well, it is a specialist on elm. Uh, we didn't have any elm. The Dutch elm disease took them out long ago. But at the University of Delaware, there are uh, a couple of large American elms that did not die. Every year they make lots of seed. I gathered up the seed in, in, in the, the gutter at, at one point, planted them, they grew right away. That was 19 years ago. And those trees are 80 feet tall right now, big success. And the caterpillar came right away, American elm. One of the evening primrose moth, uh, because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose. So I planted evening primrose and the moth came right away and spends the day with its head stuck, stuck in the, the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, uh, you know, down where we, we are and in, in um, well, most of the counties of, of the US, oaks are really important plants. So I wanna focus a little bit on, on oaks. These are just examples of the plant lineages I've added to, to our yard. But again, oaks are so important, I'm gonna focus on them. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, a lot of people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old, it's enormous. Uh, and some people say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak does for your property, what it contributes to your property, you can enjoy them immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And right away, they started to recreate the food web that supports the birds we have now. By bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the pleasant dagger moth, the delightful dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugilatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the, the oaks that we put on our property. And they come right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. You don't have to wait centuries for your oak to start to rebuild the food web where you live. This is what our house looks like today. Um, I'm sitting in this window right now. I show you this picture to show we're traditional. We've got lawn here, uh, but I put a lot of plants back. And, and I learned uh, long ago that every time I put a new plant lineage back into the, the yard, it's an opportunity to attract new species of moths to, to strengthen that, that food web. And four years ago, I decided to make it a goal to try to take a picture of every species of moth that I could find on our property. Uh, believe it or not, I'm still at it. I'm still getting new species, including today. I'm up to 1,064 species of moths so far. I used to say I thought it would top out at 1,000. No, I don't know. I don't, you know, maybe 1,100, who knows? But um, now we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the landmass, we're supporting 40% of all the moss species that occur in, in Pennsylvania. And because so many of these species are types of bird food, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why is this important? Well, we probably, you might remember this headline that we saw in the fall. Uh, World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. I'm thinking, not at our house. I am, I am convinced we have increased the biodiversity at our house by at, at least two thirds. Uh, and it didn't take that long. And we did it simply by putting the native plants back that support the life around us. It's just not that hard to reverse these terrible headlines. So don't give up, don't give up. We can reverse uh, what's, what's happening um, if we don't give up and if everybody gets, gets busy planting. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. Uh, a lot of people don't. Smaller acreage in suburbia or even smaller in cities. Will it work on smaller properties? Well, that's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house at Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. And they're in the middle of a development. All their neighbors have the big lawns. 
when they moved in their their yard was choked with bush honeysuckle armor honeysuckle one of the big invasive species out there so the first thing they did was get rid of that then they planted lots of native plants put in a water feature they call a bubbler and then they sat back and started to count the birds that have used their property they're up to 149 bird species so far including 35 warbler species just to put it in perspective on our 10 acres we've only recorded eight warbler species so does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right on the other side of this, this wall here is uh, one of the runways for O'Hare Airport. Uh, right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre that is three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. Uh, it's a pretty one tenth of an acre, but it's not connected to any natural area at all. So it is an island in Chicago. Uh, but she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants. She put in uh, 60 species of native plants and uh, a water feature. Then she sat back and started to count her birds. She's up to, oh, I got to change this, 120 species of birds have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. There it is. What about city centers though? You know, 82% of us in the US live in cities and 80% of Canadians live in cities. Are all those people gonna miss out on, on this fun? Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepius tuberosa, you probably know it as butterfly weed, which reminds me, we've got a marketing issue with our, our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed anymore. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. Okay, 2014, I was staring at Monarch's Delight. The first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bee. There was a big one and a smaller one. I know they're leafcutter bees because they, they uh, carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. They will not be in an area unless they have pollen, nectar, and a source of very soft leaves. Things like redbud are perfect because they cut the edges of the leaf out into a semicircle, leave these little semicircles. Uh, and then they roll up the leaf they have cut up, uh, cut out into a tube uh, and they stuff that tube with pollen, lay an egg on it, close it off, and then they put the whole package into a crack or a crevice and that's how they reproduce. Well, there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch Delight and I'm sure that's why there were leaf cutter bees there. They had everything they needed. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there as, as well. Not sure how many species of bumblebees, but um, I saw a couple. Remember bumblebees overwinter as queens. There are no workers when they emerge in the spring, they have to start the colony entirely by themselves, which means they need access to a lot of pollen and nectar. They've gotta be able to forage efficiently or it's too much work to get that colony going. And that's exactly what Redbud supplies. And then I saw a monarch, access to two monarchs on Monarch Delight. Now this was 2014. In 2013, I had gone the entire year without seeing a single monarch, pretty depressing. Uh, that was the low point in the Eastern monarch population. Uh, only 3.6% 3 of the monarchs were left compared to 1976. And this was June. So it was, it was early to be seeing uh, monarchs this, this far north. So I was, uh, I was impressed, I was excited. You know, maybe the monarchs weren't gonna disappear after all. Why were they there? Well, they had, they had monarchs to light, but there was another milkweed there as well. Uh, I think it's purple milkweed. Um, so they had nectar, but they had their host plants. They could, they could lay their eggs. They had everything they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of New York City, the middle of Manhattan. The High Line, if you don't know, is an elevated, it was an abandoned railroad that was, uh, was abandoned for decades. Somebody went up there and saw that there were a lot of native plants growing. So they said, let's make it a tourist destination. Uh, they did, they renovated the whole thing. Um, and this is the amount of nature that's planted on, on the High Line. It's a three foot strip of plants that runs the, the length of it. Um, there's the Monarch Delight, that's what I was staring at. Uh, so 30 feet above, above the taxis, Millions of people go there. It's a very successful tourist destination. Everybody loves this little strip of nature. So amidst all the people, all the construction, 30 feet of taxis, all the things I saw were there. That was only 20 minutes worth of observation. Somebody's done a study of, of uh, the native bees that are on the High Line using these plants. They're up to 30 species that are using them. This is Rick Dark. He uh, was always after me to go to the High Line and, and see the, the beautiful plants. 
I'm not much of a city boy, so I always drag my feet. But you know, seeing beautiful plants with nothing using them is actually depressing to me. So um, I just wasn't up for it. But finally, he dragged me there, and I was completely wrong. There were things using those plants uh, all over the place. So uh, I, I, I've converted. Uh, if, if thoughtful native plants can bring life back to the center of Manhattan, I'm convinced that we can succeed anywhere doing this. There are four things we need to think about, though, if we're going to succeed in a big way, and I do want to succeed in a big way, and one of them is we have to reduce the area that we have in lawn. Just in the U.S., we have over 40 million acres of lawn. I don't know what your stats are in, in uh, Canada, but I'm sure you got plenty of lawn, too. That's the size of New England, which is converted to an ecological deadscape. Why have we done this? Well, it's a, it's a status symbol. And the commercials tell us we have to do it. You know, if you don't have a perfect lawn, you're not a good person. And, and some, you know, we believe that. Uh, so I'm not suggesting we get rid of our, the lawn. It is a status symbol and it tells our neighbors how neat we are. But let's cut the area of lawn in half. Let's put productive plants in half the area you have in lawn. We could still manicure the, the other half and still be good, good people. But if we cut the area of lawn in half, um, that will give us 20 million acres to put towards conservation. And if we do that right at home, we can create a new national park at home that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. We will have the largest national park in the country. What do you get when you put uh, some part of nature, a park right where you live? You get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the natural world at your own pace and your own time. Maybe you had a personal relationship when you were a child, but you've lost it. You can, you can rekindle it. And you can do it by avoiding crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, there are millions of peoples there. It's also free. There's no, uh, no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. You can avoid travel hassles. Um, you get to experience the natural world alone, which uh, I don't know how you can develop a personal relationship without uh, interacting alone on your own, without you know, mediation by somebody else. And this is particularly important for our kids. Our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder. Um, they, they're not exposed to nature at all. And we're, so we're trying. We get 30 kids. We put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour. They go to a natural place, walk around for an hour. And the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back on the bus and they, they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and interact with it alone. No parental supervision. Let them work it out by themselves. Maybe they will learn how to, to hunt lizards. You know, why is it important that they work it out by themselves? They're the future stewards of the planet. And if they don't have a personal relationship with what they're stewarding, they're going to be lousy stewards. Hunting lizards, how do I, how do I know this? I'm learning this from my, my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of lawn about 10 by 10 feet and a hedge. But there are anole lizards there. Zoe discovered that and she figured out she could hunt them. And this is how you do it. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. Um, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium and then you take care of it. You learn how to be a good steward. You have, you've, developed a personal relationship with some aspect of the, the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress, uh, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture the other day, so who knows. But I do guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of it. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, uh, get Nancy Stranisti's book, Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world, right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, um, go to our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org. Uh, right now, 
and, and we want you to get on the map. Can Canadians get on the map? In June, you can. We're expanding this to include uh, Canada. What you do is you put in your, uh, your location and the amount of area that you're converting, the amount of lawn that you're converting to uh, native plantings or that you have converted that you're stewarding. Uh, and it will uh, light up with a, a uh, uh, lightning bug. You're, the piece of your, your uh, you know, in the US it's counties. I don't know if you have counties up there or not. Uh, but it'll light up and you'll get to see who else is doing it near you. You'll get to see our progress towards uh, developing that or, or restoring that 20 million acres that we were talking about. And if we reach 20 million acres, we're not going to stop there. We'll go for the entire country. Uh, this is our attempt at social media to try to get beyond the choir. I've been talking to the choir for you know, 12, 15 years now. Time to talk to people who have no idea that their piece of the world is a really important part of conservation. Okay. We're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put back uh, where we, we have taken the lawn away? Well, some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a Roman arch is? There's a Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take the keystone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take a keystone plant out of your food web, the food web collapses because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives us food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives us food webs. So think of the, the keystone plants in your yard. Uh, pretend you're building an ecological house. The keystone plants are the two by fours of that house. They're essential. The house is not gonna stand up without them. You can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. But once you have your two by fours up, you're not done. You still have to add, add other plants. So the question is, is no longer, uh, you know, are native plants better than non-native plants ecologically? Um, on average, they certainly are, but there are a whole lot of native plants, about 85% of them that, that really aren't contributing all that much. So we can't ig ignore those keystone plants. The question really is, do we want the, the really productive plants in our yards or benign plants or even worse, the ecologically destructive plants, those ornamentals that become invasive species that, that escape our yards, the buckthorns and the barberries and the burning bushes that um, have biologically polluted many of the natural areas around us. I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgo biloba, ginkgo from, from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not, whether they're productive. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars. They are not contributing to your local food web. What is contributing the most in 84% of the counties of, of North America? The genus Quercus oaks. 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic region, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. Now, as you move farther and farther north, right where you folks live, oaks drop out and willows take over as the top keystone plant. Um, but keystone plants, that's the direction you want to go. This is, this is what uh, the role the keystone oaks are playing in my yard. Remember, I've taken uh, pictures of 1,064 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. I will. Out of the 1,064 species, uh, 933 have known host plants. So the bunch, we don't know what they're eating. Of the 933 species, 278 species use oaks. And we've got 69 genera of native woody plants on our property. And only one of them is the oaks, Quercus. And we've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity. That's the role of a keystone plant in our, in our landscape. If I took oaks out, imagine what would happen to the biodiversity on our land. How do you find out what the keystone plants are? Uh, we've got an app for North America. Uh, it's, it's on uh, the uh, National Wildlife Federation website called Native Plant Finder. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, the best plants in terms of supporting caterpillars for your county pop up, both woody and, and non uh, or herbaceous plants. Don't have it for 
Canada. So I would uh, go directly to the uh, closest county in, in uh, the US. I, I don't know if it'd be in Maine or not and put in the one, a zip code from that county and you'll get a list that'll be very effective uh, where you are near Ottawa. <coughs> okay. We're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to attract a lot of insects to our yard. Uh, and then we're going to kill them with our security light. Of course, that is not the goal. There's a lot of research coming particularly out of, of Europe uh, that's very convincingly arguing that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline. And these are all the ways that lights kill insects, particularly moths at night. Um, and you know, this to me, this is actually good news because we have to turn the insect declines around. I mean, that's not something we can tolerate. And if we can do that by simply flicking a switch, turning turning out our lights at night, uh, we're getting off easy. Nothing could be easier than that. But I know what you're going to say. Well, I can't turn the light out over my garage because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to discover is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security uh, light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow LED bulb is the best because yellow wavelengths are the least attractive to uh, nocturnal insects. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save billions of insects uh, and probably billions of dollars too, because of course LEDs are much more energy efficient. Okay, we're going to we're going to uh, shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights. Then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill our insects. I don't know how much you you Canadians are buying into this, but it's a huge industry uh, in in the U.S. right now. Uh, Mosquito Joe's going around undoing everything I've been talking about for the last fifteen years. He will say, "Well, this this fog that he's he's doing is a natural product, so it's okay." It is a natural product. It's pyrethroids made from chrysanthemums, um, but uh, you know cyanide is a natural product, a natural product too. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. He'll also say that his fog only kills mosquitoes. That's not even close to true. I don't know if you followed the headlines uh, last year, but in a couple different states, there were huge monarch kills where the uh, the monarch migrating monarchs um, got fogged by mosquito fogging, and there were hundreds dead. Uh, it made the national news. This fog kills all the insects it comes in contact with. But you know, the, 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 the real tragedy here is that it doesn't work in terms of controlling mosquitoes. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of them. He's not even close to controlling the mosquito population. So you're paying a lot of money for something that kills a bunch of other insects and doesn't control the mosquitoes. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you get a bucket. People say, how big a bucket? I don't care how big, the bigger the butter. Fill it full of water and put in a handful of straw or hay. Let it ferment in the sun for a couple of days. What you're doing is building up the diatom and, and algae uh, populations in your bucket. That becomes irresistible to female mosquitoes that are going to lay their eggs. They'll lay their eggs in your bucket uh, and then you put in a mosquito dunk. You get it in the hardware, hardware store. Um, you can get a, a couple sheets of these things for, for nine bucks. Take a mosquito dunk, whoops, come back here, and put it in your bucket. The larvae, uh, once they hatch, will, it will eat it and die. It's extremely targeted. It only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in, in your bucket is a, a mosquito. Don't go throwing these in natural um, natural swamps and, and lakes and things because it kills all aquatic diptera and uh, there's a lot of, of uh, most aquatic diptera don't bite us and they're important parts of the aquatic food chain but in your bucket it's going to work great it's going to kill those mosquitoes if you've got a dragonfly in there it's not going to hurt them if your dog licks it or, or the bird drinks out of it, it doesn't hurt it a bit so here we have a targeted cheap uh, um, mosquito control approach that works particularly if everybody does it, and it doesn't kill anything else. The last thing we need to think about is um, how to landscape in a way that allows all these caterpillars that drive the food web to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, it spins a cocoon and hangs from a branch, 
then the adult emerges and it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Uh, so it's not just oaks, but on any tree, most of the caterpillars finish growing on the tree and then they drop down from the tree and wiggle their way beneath the ground and pupate underground where they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree the way we typically landscape. We mow it, we compact the soil, um, and we make sure we're nice and neat. So the caterpillars drop down and, and they die. And of course, the cement landscape is even uh, less of a viable option. This is what most people do. They have a tree in, in a lawn and nobody's measured how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this, but I guarantee they'll survive better in a situation like this, where you have a tree and then a layered landscape, maybe a, a dogwood here and then a native azalea and ferns, ground cover. Your caterpillars drop down to a safe site. The soil is not compacted. They can easily get beneath the ground and pupate, uh, or they can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under here. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put a bed around your trees, put a big bed around your trees, safe sites. This is where you can use your, your uh, ground covers, things like wild ginger or, or may apple or foam flower or ferns. This is, a, uh, this is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maples. Any caterpillar that develops on these red maples drops down into this fern bank and they can complete their development, even though it's the middle of a city. We can do a lot better with the way we, we landscape under our trees. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and her results suggest there is room for compromise in our plant choices, and that's good news to me. What she did was compare how well chickadee populations were sustained in suburban landscapes that were dominated by native plants versus uh, landscapes dominated by introduced plants. And the first thing she found is that um, there were 75% fewer caterpillars when the landscapes were dominated by introduced plants. So right away, the amount of bird food is reduced by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. The birds came, came, there were nest boxes there, but they looked around and they said, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, the nest uh, contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. Uh, if they did survive, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. If you put all those numbers into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of a non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from none to 100%, this is what you get. We focused on, on uh, woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. But if you make fewer babies down over here, you've got a, an unsustainable shrinking population. Right here is where those lines overlap, which suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. They can't be invasive. We can't tolerate that. Uh, invasive plants are, are like uh, releasing smallpox spores on your, on your property. They're, they're cancerous. They just keep growing and growing. But things like forsythia and boxwood and crepe myrtle, those things, they're not uh, invasive. The ginkgo, uh, those, those are fine as long as they don't dominate your, your landscape, as long as 75% 70 of your woody plant biomass is native. But this is the part I'm excited about because it does introduce the concept of compromise, which to me is, is good news because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would listen. We love our non-native plants. It is not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. So if we put more native plants into our yards, we can tolerate more of these. Can we use native plants in formal plantings. Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. I got this just the other day on, on email. This is a, a shot from a drone about 400 feet up. So this is a big garden, but every plant in that very formal garden uh, is a native plant. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. I guess that's okay because they're not native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator uh, garden into a traditional uh, suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. 
that that formalizes it tells people it's intentional it's not just a pile of weeds it's addressing the needs of a number of, of uh, specialist bees um, it's not very big it could be could be bigger but um, i want to review why we need pollinators uh, you know you the the commercials tell you you need it because they pollinate a third of our crops a very anthropocentric view about about why pollinators are important it's not even true they pollinate about a twelfth of our crops and people who don't live next to a farm say well i don't need any pollinators because i don't live next to a farm forget the the agriculture argument we need pollinators because they pollinate 80 percent of all plants and 90 percent of all flowering plants if we lost our pollinators we lose 80 to 90 percent of the plants on the planet not an option where do we need pollinators everywhere we need we need plants which is everywhere how about this, a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life that's supported here versus the amount of life that's supported here. No brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost sharing program. It's called Lawn to Legumes, that, uh, where you get paid to, to uh, convert some or all of your lawn to appropriate Minnesota planting. It's a very popular program. Um, a similar, much younger program in Pennsylvania, only two years old, but you get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your lawn into uh, something that helps the watershed, uh, but it also certainly helps biodiversity. There's an island off Florida that's paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, you get paid to take care of it. Everybody would want an endangered species. Missouri and, and uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas had a bounty on cow repairs. You take out the cow repair, you get a free tree replacement. And even water utilities are getting into the act in the drier areas. You get a hundred dollar coupon to put in water efficient native plants and take out the, the thirsty non-natives. And of course, the lawn conversion programs in California, also very popular, $2 per square foot rebate to take out that thirsty lawn, which just doesn't belong there, and put in appropriate xeric plantings. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one uh, is that somehow we started to think of nature as being optional. In other words, it's not essential, which means when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always nature loses out. I went to the uh, Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there was this wall-sized poster there that, that epitomizes, in my view, our society's view of, of uh, conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so the future generations can enjoy it, can appreciate it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We need to save these special places so that future generations can enjoy them. But to me, that suggests nature's there just for entertainment and that otherwise we don't need it. Um, not true. No wonder we don't think it's essential. It's, it's far more than entertainment. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation efforts just to, to where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those places are too small and too uh, isolated from each other. David Quammen has a, an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that, that uh, language because it suggests that there are places on planet with no ecological significance. Not true. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to put the plants back and glue our rug back together again, not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between healthy, uh, viable habitats, but we wanna create viable habitats where there are none right now, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we farm. We're gonna to start to, to share our spaces, to coexist with nature for the first time in modern history. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few, few ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, because everybody on the planet requires, they depend entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't they bear responsibility for, for uh, the stewardship of those, earth, those ecosystems? 
I have no idea. Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset is I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. So many of us feel powerless today. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink their lawn. They can get rid of their invasive plants. They can put in a pollinator garden. They can use keystone species. They can revitalize the ecosystem where they live and, and enhance their local ecosystem instead of degrade it. And that also shrinks the, the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire earth's problem. You'll get depressed if you do that. Just worry about your piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a, a park or preserve. They're all underfunded, all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now, I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ptolemy. I think that was such a such an interesting and engaging presentation and something like that, you know, hits close to home for I hope everyone on the call and anyone who listens to this. You're I'm welcome. Gonna, I'm gonna open up to questions if that's okay. I see there's yeah, a few in the yeah. chat if we have if we have some time. And uh, I'm going to go through them, guys, just in the order that they were voted. And uh, we'll see. I'll read them off to you, Dr. Ptolemy, and see mm -hmm. what advice we can share with others. The first question, which was upvoted, was our, our thoughts on dandelions, actually. And so the question from Jennifer was, what are our thoughts on dandelions? And uh, what is a native flower that they might have displaced? Uh, that's a good question. Um, of course, dandelions thrive in disturbed areas, particularly our, our lawns, if we don't put down an herbicide and kill them. Um, they're transglobal at this point. You know, uh, I'm not even sure where, where they started. They're closely related to several species of plants in North America. And a number of pollinators, particularly generalist pollinators, do use them. So is a lawn with dandelions more productive than a lawn without one? Absolutely. Uh, is a roadside with dandelions uh, more productive? Yes. And not only that, there are a number of, of ground caterpillars, things that forage on, on low plants that eat dandelions. So I would never spend any effort trying to get rid of dandelions. Uh, you know, when it comes to non-native problem plants, that does not rise to the, to the top. The only reason they're a problem is because the commercials tell you they are. That, you know, that you don't have a perfect lawn if you have a dandelion. But um, Sometimes it's worth ignoring the commercials. <laughs> of course. Well, thanks for sharing. The next question is uh, on pesticide use. And in, in Ontario, or rather in Eastern Ontario, our predominant land use is agriculture. And most of the land is farmed for uh, corn and soybean production. And so there's a few questions in the chat about protecting our own wildflower gardens uh, against per pesticide and herbicide application, if there's anything that we can do on our own properties to uh, protect against drift. Why? <laughs> you can encourage your neighbors to spray responsibly when there's no wind, but um, it, yeah, it's a problem everywhere. That yeah. uh, uh, And there's, there's one, one product that is really bad uh, when it drifts. It just wipes out everything. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is this is what central governments are for to try to get get us to coexist, um, have the farmers be responsible enough, and realize they do have neighbors. And I know they get they get um, a little short tempered and exasperated with people moving in next to the farms. You know, we got a farm, and um, I understand. I so try to work out some some compromise. But boy, I don't know how to stop drift. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's it's an issue. I mean, from a conservation authority perspective, we would always want to encourage windbreaks and trees along farm fields. I mean, that, that does go a long way, you know, from water 
conservation to sediment and erosion control. I mean, there's lots of benefits from having trees along our farm fields and certainly I hope that would help as well. And I think your, your comment on, you know, being a good neighbor, being a good steward of the land. Uh, I grew up on a farm and th that's something that's incredibly important for us is working very closely with our neighbors, making sure that uh, what we do on the land um, you know, positively affects our neighbors and the environment. And so I always encourage people to reach out. I know it's always sometimes scary to talk to your neighbors and, and see what's going on on their farm or how you can work together um, to improve your environment. But certainly uh, being a good neighbor and being a good friend uh, can go a long way. You bring up a great point about hedgerows though. You know, the elimination of hedgerows has been a disaster from a biodiversity point of view. Um, as long as those hedgerows are primarily native plants. Now, over the years, they started to be replaced and they were all non-natives, but uh, they can be powerful forms of, of um, maintaining natural enemies, intercepting uh, nutrient-laden runoff, um, so, you know, supporting the complex communities of, of pollinators, um, and a whole lot of bird food. Lots of, pl of, of very, very uh, important things. In the, in the Midwest, um, the hedgerows and the edges of, of fields next to, to rows were the only place there is any biodiversity left. And now most of them are gone. It is a biological dead space as you drive across, um, you know, just absolutely nothing there. And that is what has, has, has devastated the monarch more than anything else. The total elimination of weeds on the side of the road or in hedgerows. Uh, and, and how much was gained in terms of, of, of uh, yield on the farms? If anything was lost, I would love to see, this is where we should use subsidies. We shouldn't say, okay, to the grower, you have to pay the price for saving biodiversity. Everybody enjoys this biodiversity. Everybody depends on it. So there should be a, a, a pay-per-use fee for the earth. And some of that should go to the, the growers who are giving up land to protect the, the biodiversity. It wouldn't take much. One trip to Starbucks, you know, would be a yearly fee that could uh, easily pay for hedgerow maintenance uh, and, and roadside maintenance throughout the, the entire country. So this is a problem that, that could be solved if we thought it was important. For sure. Yeah. And I should, I should drop a plug. I mean, for those interested or listening and, and wondering how you can plant a hedgerow or make it more affordable, we do offer uh, a cost share program in Eastern Ontario to help plant hedgerows. Um, but your comment, Dr. Talamy, on the maintenance of hedgerows is a good one. It's not something that we, we fund or we promote, but we do have something in Ontario called the Alternative Land Use Service, um, which is funded uh, in part by the province, but also by private donations. And it does help uh, provide maintenance costs to farmers and property owners uh, to help maintain pollinator habitat, uh, you know, longer mowing seasons, grass buffers around water courses. So that's something great, a great resource to check out as well if you're wondering, uh, you know, how to get some funding to help do more work on your property. Which kind of leads us to our next question, which which is about roadways, Dr. Talmy. It's, it's definitely something that a lot of people talk about. How can we improve our practices, our mowing practices, our mowing behaviors on roadways. So there's lots of comments in the chat about uh, counties and municipalities uh, maintaining roadways and, and how that looks. And, and maybe if you have any comments you wanted to share around best practices or considerations. And, and of course, I do encourage people uh, to check out the Community of Practice in Eastern Ontario that, that is funded by the Canadian Wildlife Federation because there are some counties and municipalities that are doing great work uh, to help change some of these mowing behaviors, but certainly in our area, there's lots, lots that we can do, and, and hopefully we can do do this together. Yeah, the history of mowing our roadways is an interesting one because if if you ask people why we do it now, the um, the safety uh, argument always comes up. But well, we have to mow them because something's hiding in there and it runs out and gets hit by a car, and it's a safety issue. There's actually no data supporting that at all. The origins of mowing. Um, happened uh, a long time ago, and it was somebody in, I don't know, the USDA or somewhere said, you know, our roadsides ought to be look like nice lawns. We should be mowing them. And it was all about aesthetics. Uh, and they started and it caught on like wildfire because it looked good. Uh, it also provided jobs. It costs a lot of money, but uh, it's all been about aesthetics. So do we need to mow? No. Or if we do, we could mow once a year in the, the winter time. 
um, but uh, it could be viable habitat most of the year. So uh, it's it's uh, it's just one of those things we do that is not necessary. We spend an awful lot of money on it. Uh, and at this point, in so many places, it's good habitat, or, or could be. So, yeah, for sure. I have a question from an anonymous uh, attendee, uh, and it's about some advice you provided in one of your books. I'm just going to read the question. It was, uh, I almost bought a mulcher to help all my newly acquired native plants over winter in our negative 40 degree winter temperatures up here in Canada, until I read in your book about the number of species that hide and curled up leaves over the winter. The question is, do we need to add mulch to our plants over the winter? And if yes, uh, what do we use for mulch? Well, you can add those, the mulch in terms of whole leaves. It's the, it's the pulverizing them that kills what's, what's in there. Normally those leaves fall down, they form a blanket uh, and you do wanna protect the soil, not just from the cold, but from the dry. Um, that's, a, that's a critical part of what's happening. We, we tend to think, or we should start thinking of the leaves on our property in the same way we think about water. So when it rains, we want all the rain to stay on the property so they can infiltrate, no more runoff. And we have, you know, we've got uh, rainwater uh, gardens and all those things to do that. Same thing with the leaves. Every leaf that falls on your property should stay on your property. No more raking it up and putting it out on the curb as if it's trash, because that's the nutrients that recycles uh, into all of your plants. So finding places to, to put your leaves that have all the, the uh, overwintering. Uh, they're particularly, uh, you know, caterpillars, pupae, little lepidoptera, is an important uh, component. And that's um, you know, that's if you're putting beds under your trees to help those caterpillars complete the development, like I talked about, that's a great place to put, put your, your leaves. Uh, and yes, it does protect the, the roots of, of your plants. I've got a little, little experiment going right, right here at home. It's kind of anecdotal, but you know, what happens when you don't rake any of those leaves away in the spring? Can your plants still get up there? Yes, they can. I've, I've got pictures of all everything pushing right up, just like they used to before we were here helping them out. Um, so plants are much better at pushing through leaf litter. Now they're not going to push through four feet of, of leaves if you pile them up there. But a normal layer of, of uh, leaf litter uh, is the best way to protect the soil organisms, the soil moisture, the temperature of, of the, you know, it is, it is an insulating map. Um, but a normally thick layer, I mean, not, not, not abnormally thick. <laughs> For sure. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, and, and thanks again, everyone, for sending these questions in. And, and thanks to those who are uh, participating in some chat in the actual chat box. Some of these questions are heavy hitting. So congrats, Dr. Talamy, with having good, good responses ready for some of these. Um, I'll try and take three more questions, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. So there's a question on wild parsnip. And the question is from Jennifer, and she says, our township sprays for wild parsnip. And she's wondering if there's any good alternatives for swallowtails in particular. You know, that's probably a pointed question, but I wonder if, if maybe you have any advice um, to share on that. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, there are, there, there are several good um, natives in the parsnip family. Uh, and what is it, Sweet sweet Sicily? Is that what? I always blank out on this one. It's yellow flower. <laughs> uh, they do exist. Uh, you, can, you can look them up, but uh, it doesn't have to be wild parsnip. Um, but you know what? This is, this is one of these exceptions where, um, of course, uh, uh, carrots and... Um, and um, See, my brain is fried at this, this point. <laughs> <laughs> dill, dill. Oh, yeah. You know, the black swallowtail loves both of those. They're both, both in that family of plants. And we have bred out the nasties in them. So here's a, it's the chemical cue that says, this is the right family of plants you should be eating. And there are no nasties in there, which is why we can eat it. So the, the, the butterflies take advantage of that as well. So carrots and parsley and dill. Um, are all, uh, if you really want to support your, your black swallowtails, just plant a bunch of that right in your, in your yard. But um, boy, what is the name of that, that other plant that can be, should be part of your meadows? Anybody know? Ask somebody in the chat, they'll tell you. 
Yeah, if someone has any, <laughs> someone can help us out, please drop a comment in the chat. I mean, I, I feel ashamed for not being able to help you on that one. <laughs> well, I feel ashamed for that. I have blanked out on that. That's one of these blanks Someone's I've asking had for about, years. Uh, yeah. Queen's Anne's lace, maybe. I mean, that that's they'll use that as well. Of course, that's another non-native. I mean, you have enough of that as it is. There's no reason yeah. to plant that. But well, I'll go to our next question, which is on hayfields, I believe, if I can find it. Yeah. And so uh, the question is: Are hayfields with non-native species displayed displacing native grass species? And and the question from Jennifer is just: Is there a solution? Um, for our native grass seed? Well, you know, the hay is being grown for livestock and it, they picked the species uh, and they've, you know, looked at this over many, many generations that have the most nutrition for the, the horses. And, and uh, so it's not, it's not just, remember, um, cattle are, are European species as well. There are plenty of native grasses Horses evolved in North America. They certainly can eat native native grasses, but um, they're typically bunch grasses. Uh, warm season grasses are um, they're difficult to mow because they grow in in clumps rather than nice nice even fields. So hay fields are it's it's a type of agriculture that is um, it certainly does compete with. Uh, what could be growing on that that land, and it makes it makes the use of land that is not in agriculture all the more important. Um, that's why I focus on that 40 million acres in turf grass, which is there just for for you know aesthetics. We could have uh, all of the native uh, grasses are important components of uh, eastern meadows, which is an extremely endangered ecosystem because that's the easiest place to farm. They were plowed up right away. We had uh, specialist birds like the heath hen, now extinct. Uh, they depended entirely on Eastern meadows. It wasn't just prairie in the Midwest that supported a lot of ground nesting birds. Um, I don't know if the, the Eastern meadowlark gets as far north as, as you guys, but it's, you know, it's disappearing very rapidly mm -hmm. because of the loss of these, these, um, these places. So any place you can establish an Eastern meadow uh, that's not in competition with with agriculture is, is certainly desirable. Where I am, people mow for hay for the mushroom industry and they are much less fussy about what is growing. Uh, when I said they were mowing all the invasive plants, they really are because it's just, it's, it's kind of like biofuel, they're growing, growing mushrooms on it. That would be no good for livestock. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm hitting the, the question, but um, I don't think you can just replace the, the non-native grasses that support our, our haying industry mm -hmm. with, with natives without some loss in nutrition. And of course, the reason you want the natives there is, is that it's great habitat for nesting birds and you can't mow it during the, the nesting season, yeah. which defeats the purpose of having the hay to begin with, so. Yeah. That is I, sh I, I should mention too, the Eastern Meadowlark and, and the Bovalink as well are, are species at risk in Ontario and it's something it's certainly along with the monarch, we've, we've, we've noticed considerable declining habitat in recent years. And so there is uh, several partnership programs that are funded by the province to help support habitat for the Eastern Meadowlark and Bovalink. And, and often it starts with changing mowing behaviors and, and planting native grasses as well. And, um, I should mention that the Canadian Wildlife Federation has, has been working in Eastern Ontario to try and establish a local seed bank for some of our native grasses and, and some good wildflower pollinator species. And I think just last year they worked with the Kempville for uh, the Ferguson Forest Center in Kempville um, to put together um, an actual seed bank for people to buy. And so that's really great. There's lots, I think, that from that alone that we can do on our own properties. And, and certainly if you own larger tracts of land, um, while not perfect or ideal, there is some support. And uh, if anyone has questions after the webinar, feel free to shoot us uh, an email or give us a call and we can help point you in the right direction, help you out on that. Research has shown that, that delaying the first mowing um, until, well, I'm not sure about where you guys live. Where, where we live, if you can delay it till the end of June, mm -hmm. you can get that 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 first nesting of, of both bobolinks and meadowlarks through. Yeah, um, that's that's just a very simple thing to do. It 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 probably does cost some productivity in in the the hay, but you know 
yeah. li life is full of trade-offs. That's, that's the issue. Certainly. That's where the compensation should come in. You know, yes. Pay that grower to change his, his behavior. We have the money. You know, the entire uh, national park budget in the U.S. is equal to one B-3 bomber. We've got the money. It just, <laughs> it's just, you know, what are we spending it on is, is the issue. So Certainly. Well, I do see it is kind of our time, Dr. Talmy. So I do want to, I, I mean, I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Thanks so much for the participation. For those uh, tuning in from the SDG Butterfly Way project, thank you again for your, your interest. And thanks again for all of the work and initiative and effort to date. I, I think together we'll be able to accomplish a lot on this front. Uh, I, I've seen uh, several counselors and several municipal staff uh, in the chat on this call. So I'd like to acknowledge and also thank you for the time that you've taken tonight. Uh, to join us. And I do hope that uh, for those who watch the webinar in the future, especially our, our, our volunteers, um, I do hope that there's lots of lessons learned and take away from here. And I also encourage anyone who hasn't read one of Dr. Talamy's books or podcasts, uh, feel free to check them out. There's lots of great useful information. And, uh, and to you, Dr. Talamy, thank you so much for taking the time out of your Friday night to join us to share your story and uh, hopefully uh, to inspire and instill some, you know, positive behavioral changes in all of us tonight. Thanks for the chance. For sure. And uh, yeah, thank, great comments in the chat, guys. Thanks again so much. Uh, I'm going to end this, this webinar. I hope you have a great weekend, uh, great summer ahead, and uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions, comments, or want to get together to discuss ways to improve pollinator habitat in Eastern Ontario. Okay, take care, everybody.